The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for, before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com Good evening, dear friends, uh, both in Ukraine and worldwide. I'm Vyacheslav Pokatil, and on behalf of Mimki Business School, welcome you on Reinforce UA project. Uh, this project was designed uh, in order to uh, inspire uh, uh, Ukrainian business community, and we intended to bring the most renowned intellectuals to share their views and opinion about where the world is moving to and how we shall live in this in this world. The project was made possible due to the general support of Bogdan Havrelshin Family Foundation, 50 Thinkers Organization, and major worldwide active uh, business education uh, associations, ACSB, AMBA, FMD, and CIMAN. Before I shall give the floor to our honorable guest today, I would like to remind you that uh, uh, you can ask questions uh, uh, online at the end of the presentation. And for this purpose, I kindly ask you to use a Q&A button rather than chat. Um, please remember that this video and this webinar will be uh, recorded and, and the video will be available afterwards uh, in, uh, on, on this site and also on, on most uh, Mim Kiev uh, presence in YouTube and other, and other outlets. Um, now I'm honored to introduce uh, Professor Herman Simon, who is going to speak today about hidden champions. The concept Professor Simon developed over many years and presented in several books. Uh, Herman Simon uh, is the management consultant and uh, an expert in strategy, marketing, and pricing. He's a founder and an honorable chairman of Simon Kusher and Partners. Uh, and in German speaking country, he has been continuously voted as the most inflation living management thinker since uh, 2005, so most, more, more than 15 years already. Before committing himself entirely to consulting, uh, Professor Simon was a full professor of business administration and marketing at the University of Mines and also a visiting professor at Harvard Business School, Stanford, London Business School, INSEAD, uh, Keio University in Tokyo, and uh, MIT in Boston. Professor Simon had published over 35 books and many have become worldwide bestsellers. Uh, Professor Simon was uh, and is a member of editorial boards of numerous business journals and served as a board member of numerous foundations and uh, corporations. Uh, Professor Simon received numerous international awards and holds honorable doctorship from AECD, Business School of Bled, Slovenia, from University of, of Siegen. Germany and from Kazminsky University in Warsaw. He is an honorable professor at the University of International Business and, and Economics in Beijing in China and has a Hermann School Business School named after him uh, uh, active in China. With this, uh, I'm happy um, uh, to welcome Professor Simon on our project and um, uh, we are looking forward to learn more about hidden champions and what secrets they are hiding. Professor Pogotilo, thank you very much for this friendly introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like uh, to start with a few personal remarks. I missed Ukraine in late 2019. I had booked a nine day trip to Odessa to attend and uh, experience the music there. And a few months earlier, I broke my leg, and that would have been a wonderful experience. I hope I can repeat it in the, in the near future. We have also had many contacts uh, since the war broke out with Ukrainians. My wife took care of women and, and children from, the, from Ukraine who came to Bonn in Germany, where we live. So I think I can understand uh, at least a little uh, your situation. I focus, however, now on the presentation and uh, share the screen. Oh, I forgot to 
you can repeat okay. to push the sound button oh it's it's okay it's uh, marked so my topic is hidden champions learning from the world's best unknown companies and i would like to now the slides don't move what's going on that they don't move it's always <clears throat> Yeah, they move now. Uh, I would like to set your expectation right in the sense that I do not have enough substantial knowledge about uh, Ukrainian companies to make any remarks during my presentations, but I'm totally open to all questions. So um, at the end, please feel free to ask questions uh, and I will, I will comment. But my presentation is uh, focusing especially on hidden champions from German-speaking countries. And let's start with two simple questions. First, what are the best companies in the world? And you would probably name some of these companies, Apple, Tesla, Amazon, Microsoft, which is a correct answer. They are excellent companies. But it's unlikely that a normal company or normal entrepreneur is going to be one Apple or a Microsoft. So are they role models for, for entrepreneurs in countries like Ukraine or even in Germany? Probably not. Then the second question, what and where are the markets of this world? And when I ask uh, normal people this question, they say, oh, automotive, uh, smartphones, uh, big airplanes, etc." So they uh, associate the economy with the large markets they know. Say we have 20,000 markets, separable markets in the world, then maybe 200 are large markets. So 1%. 99 are small and niche markets. And if we look at the question where, there's a clear concentration. The US is about 21% of the world market, the European Union 16, China 15. And these three regions, I call the first global league. They account for more than 50% of the global market and the rest of the world is 48%. So what is my first lesson? It's unlikely that you will become an Apple, a Tesla or a dominant force in one of the few large market. But the world offers a huge number of smaller markets where you can become a leader. So it's a different view of the world with regard to attractiveness of markets. Now I look at exports, which are certainly one of the most valid measures of international competitiveness. And if we look at the export situation in absolute terms, we see China is by far the number one. USA is second. And if I combine the German speaking countries, DACH, what we call DACH for Deutschland, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, which is Confederatio Helvetia, therefore DACH. It's similar to the US and even Germany alone is not far behind the US, but far ahead of all other large countries. And this is even more strongly reflected if we look at per capita exports. You see Germany and DACH are far ahead of the other large countries. Double what France, the United Kingdom also have, so they are in the same geostrategic position, same distance to the large markets in China, the US. So what is, what is going on there? Of course, countries do not export. Uh, the export of Germany or Ukraine is a statistical artifact. Only companies export. The question then is, 
who, which companies determine export performance, large companies or small and medium-sized enterprises? If we, I were there in person, I would uh, you ask you to raise your hands if it's large companies or SMEs. Actually, for most countries, it's large companies. Here I show you on the horizontal axis the Fortune Global 500 companies and on the vertical axis the exports. And you see that for most countries, it's an almost linear correlation between the number of Fortune Global 500 companies, so very large companies, and the export performance. And there are two exceptions, China combined and then Germany or DACH. And we have seen that China and Germany DACH are the leaders in exports in terms of absolute or per capita. So what is different for them? The difference is the role of SMEs for the export performance. In China, 68% of the exports come from small and mid-sized enterprises. In, in Germany, the number is similar, about two thirds. And I call these strong exporters hidden champions. What is a hidden champion? A company which belongs to the top three in the world, has a revenue less than $5 billion or euros. Now you may say, but five billion, the small or mid-sized company, that's the upper threshold. The average revenue is about 500 million. And if you compare this size to the Fortune Global 500, they have an average revenue of 84 billion and the smallest Global 500 still crosses $32 billion. So the hidden champions are a new category of larger, small, mid-sized companies with a global presence, but not known so hidden in the public. That's why I call them hidden champions, which is a contradiction because champions you normally know, how can they be hidden? My second lesson, to really excel in globalization, a country needs hidden champions meaning a large number of small and mid-sized companies which are world-class in manufacturing, marketing, exporting. And I would say that's even more true for Ukraine than it is for Germany, because in Germany you have quite a few large companies, but still the strength of Germany comes from the mid-sized companies, what we call the Mittelstand in Germany, the hidden champions. Now, this was a more global view Let's go to the business level. What defines the hidden, the hidden champions strategy? And I have here seven pillars, you could say. The core is the will, the ambition to be the best. How do you achieve that? By focusing. Only focus leads to world class. But focus makes the market small. How do you make it large? By globalization. So they are connected. Focus makes the market small. Globalization makes it large. Then you need continuous innovation. And then we have two new driving forces, digitalization, ecosystems, and sustainability. And I will illustrate these pillars of the hidden champion strategy, each through a few cases, quotes, examples. The will to be the best. Stiel, the global leader in Chainsaw, says either we are the best or we don't do it. For instance, they make their own batteries because they say the batteries must be different for our purposes. So. They make their own batteries, very specifically adjusted to their needs for portable tools. Egos, global leader in motion plastics, states, we only do things where we are the best in the world. Or 3B scientific, global leader in anatomical teaching aids, 
we want to become and stay number one in the world, or DeepL, the leading translation machine, we deliver the best translations in the world. That is the entrepreneurial core, the will to be the best in your market in what you do. Chemital, global leader in surface treatment, our goal is the worldwide technology and marketing leadership. Our market vision, global leader in computer-generated imagery, our ambition is to be the absolute number one worldwide. And their software is applied in Games of Thrones and other famous films and uh, series. ZIC, a global market leader in sensors, we lead by anticipating our customers' expectations Leadership means becoming the benchmark for others. We set the standard in the world market. So again, this ambition to be the best to become the market leader. How do you achieve it? By focus. Again, a few examples. Flexi, global leader in retractable dock leashes. We only focus on one thing, but we do it better than anyone else. Can you imagine that this company has a 70% global market share for these seemingly simple products? They are actually not simple. They are highly sophisticated. Or Ullmann, global leader in pharmaceutical packaging. We do only one thing, but we do it right. They could also package food or electronic gadgets. No, they say we focus on the pharmaceutical industry to be and remain the best. Or Nemichek, global leader in software for architects and engineers, focus on one thing and be the world's best at it. I said focus makes a market small. If you sell dock leashes only in Germany, that's a tiny market. How do you make it big? By globalizing. And here's the example of the globalization process of Kelsha, world market leader in high pressure water cleaners. They started in the 70s, and ever since then, they have added one, sometimes two subsidiaries to their global network and have now 150 subsidiaries in about 100 countries. They establish their global network through their own subsidiaries, not through distributors or agents, through third parties. They do it on their own, which takes, of course, time. It takes decades. And I applied the Hidden Champion strategy one-to-one -one and globalization for Simon Kutcher, our consulting company, has been our main growth driver. We have now 48 offices in 31 countries and here you see our growth path driven by globalization as the most important growth driver. We are the global leader in uh, price consulting, and uh, this would also be a very small market if we can find ourselves to Germany. So we went into the whole world, but still have a far way to go to be in all, all relevant countries. Cross driver innovation. Of course, innovation starts with uh, investments into research and development, and the Eden Champions spent double the industry average. What is more important, the output. Uh, if we look at patent intensive industries, hidden champions have five times more than the average company, more in terms of per employee. And I show you three examples of breakthrough innovations. Since I was in the Air Force, they are all from aerospace. Um, before here, we see patents per 1,000 employees, uh, five times more. <laughs>
that was too fast. This video obviously doesn't run. That's Lilium. No, it doesn't run. That is an electric uh, airplane. Uh, why the video doesn't run, I don't know. And here is another one, the third. This is a hydrogen powered plane currently in the test phase. Uh, So these are just three examples of breakthrough innovations coming from hidden champions. One very important point here with regard to innovation is innovation, the challenge is the integration of customer needs and technology. And you see here on the right side, the hidden champions are much better in this integration jobs than large corporations. 65% of the hidden champions say that they manage the integration of customer needs and technology very well, whereas only 19% of large companies say that. Lesson three, ambition to be the best and the market leader, focus, globalization and innovations are the pillars of success of the hidden champions. The challenge of innovation lies in the integration of technology and customer leads, which the hidden champions manage particularly well. Now let's come to the new driving forces, digitalization, business ecosystems, and sustainability. In digitalization, the hidden champions focus on B2B. Uh, there is no chance for German or European companies to compete against the big American guys or uh, the Chinese companies in mass digitalization markets. And the reason is very simple. Let me explain it through the example of Uber. Uber tested its system in uh, San Francisco for several years, and then they rolled it out to all American cities without modifications. If you do the same in Berlin or Kiev and then want to roll it out to Europe, you have to overcome 27 bureaucracies and languages. So global standards in mass digitalization will not come from Europe or from an individual country in Europe. There are some exceptions like Spotify or Scape, but as a rule, they will come from America. That's very different in business to business digitalization. Here are a few examples. TeamViewer, global leader in so-called remote screen sharing, is installed on more than 2.5 billion devices. LSTM, which stands for long short-term memory, is on more than 3 billion smartphones. DeepL, I mentioned already, is the best translation system, tested against Google and uh, Microsoft, and always superior. Celonis is a global leader in process mining. And look at this number. Apple has 767 suppliers in Germany. When I ask business experts, they usually say maybe 10 or 20. No, it's 767. Or if you look at the autonomous driving scene, over the last uh, 10 years, about one third of all patents are from Germany. Germany is the first country with level three autonomous driving and Mercedes is ahead of Tesla. It just got a few months ago, the first certification for level three in California and Nevada. So these are all hidden areas. Nobody knows what is behind the uh, autonomous driving system. And uh, these are all these hidden champions. The same is true for the, for the smartphone. For instance, there's one supplier who delivers 19 different clues, adhesives for the smartphone, the German supplier. The second new driving force, business ecosystems. And I illustrate this through two cases. This is extreme ultraviolet lithography. The customers there are the foundries or the integrated device manufacturers like Taiwan Semiconductor, Intel. And the company which makes these EUV, EUV systems is ASML, a Dutch company. 
and they have two key partners in their system, Trumpf, which contributes the laser, and Zeiss, which contributes the optical system. And look at the technical features of these components in this ecosystem. The Trumpf uh, laser amplifier shoots 50,000 tin drops per second on the ship and consists of 457,000 components. So that's pretty high tech. I call it actually deep tech, not high tech, because we don't see that. The size system is even more complex. It brings the distance on the ship down from 193 to 13 nanometers. It places on one fingertip 56 billion transistors, and it took 22 years to develop this system. And uh, here is a second ecosystem. They make so-called investment casting systems. These are systems on which very complex structures are cast. And uh, the main player here in this ecosystem is MK Technology, a small company they supply these investment casting systems to SpaceX, the uh, rocket company of Elon Musk. And in the Los Angeles factory, they have six of these systems. To do the same job, SpaceX would need 1,000 large 3D printers. How can a small hidden champion achieve that? Only by cooperating in a business ecosystem with companies from China, from Germany, from Israel, from France. And they combine their competences and are able to achieve this extreme technical performance. So two cases of new business ecosystem. I think this is very important in the future also for companies from Ukraine to combine competencies from different fields across countries, across the whole world. The last new driving force, sustainability. Some people say sustainable is the new digital. They may be right. And the hidden champions are often leading in sustainable technology. And sustainable goes through all industry, be it raw materials, savings, new materials, industrial processes, new energy, food, etc. I, I pick one example here, which is actually from Austria, Lensing. Our shirts are normally made from cotton. This shirt is made from wooden fibers, uh, viscosis, and it's called, the fiber is called Lycosel. And you see the difference between a cotton shirt and a Lycosel shirt. Water consumption, cotton shirt, 2,700 liters, Lycosel, 180 liters. Land, Six square meters for cotton, 0.6 square meters for Lycosel. Cotton shirts, cotton plantations consume 25% of the global pesticide production, zero for Lycosel, and the price and cost range is about the same. So again, a revolutionary innovation uh, with regard to sustainability. So lesson four, Digitalization, business ecosystems, and sustainability are the new driving forces. The hidden champions are in a good starting position. And the reason there is that most of these new markets are niche markets in the beginning, which are not that interesting for the big guys and uh, offer a great opportunity for hidden champions. Where does this success come from? It's, of course, rooted in the inner strengths and a few uh, shed lights on this. Employees, these companies have more work than heads, expressed differently to few people. High performance culture, high qualification, low turnover. For instance, hidden champions invest 9% compared to 6% into apprenticeships, vocational training, so 50% more than the average German company, which is already very high relative to the global percentage. The hidden champions have doubled their share of university and college graduates in the last 10 years from 9 to 19 percent. And global competition is more and more about qualification, less and less about low costs alone. 
Recently, the CEO of Intel was asked why he, he selected Germany, Magdeburg in East Germany, as a location for the new Gigafactory, where Intel invests uh, 30 billion euros. And he said the first aspect, availability of talent. Second, logistics. Third, quality of life, which includes political stability and only number four, costs. The simple jobs uh, are made by uh, automation and robots in the future. And so qualification, availability of talent become more and more important. Now, if you hire competent people, train them, it's very important to keep them. And here you see the turnover rates. At the bottom are the hidden champions with 2.7% turnover per year much lower than even Germany or let alone other countries like the US. And I think this indicator is extremely important to achieve durable high performance. Uh, if an employee leaves, he takes away his or her know-how, customer relationships. So having a low turnover rate is strategically extremely important. The leaders, the leadership is ambivalent, namely also authoritarian in the principles, but participative and flexible in the details. So it's clear where the ship is heading, but the employees have a lot of freedom in how they execute the job. It's not everything is in detail, regulated by manuals, etc. The leaders come young into power. We have more women in top positions and then a very high continuity of the leaders. The CEOs of the hidden champions stay at the helm of their companies for an average of 21 years in large corporations that's only six years. I think that tells you everything about long-term orientation. So the hidden champions have more work than heads and high performance cultures. Employee loyalty is high and turnover rates are very low. The hidden champions have strong leaders whose leadership is authoritarian in the principles, but flexible in the details. Continuity is very high. To summarize, the world offers unlimited growth opportunities beyond the large markets of which we are thinking all the time. The will to be the best is the foundation of hidden championships. There it starts with the entrepreneur. Only focus leads to world class, but makes the market small. Globalization makes a market large. Innovate. In innovation, integrate technology and customer needs. Digitalization, serve niches rather than mass markets and B2B. In B2C, it will be very difficult against the Americans and in China against the Chinese. Employ business ecosystems to cope with ever-increasing complexity. Sustainability can become the new digital and employee qualification, loyal and loyalty, and strong leaderships are keys to success. Here I have some specific lessons for Ukraine. Again, Kumkrano Zales with a certain hesitance. Avoid the mistake of German reunification when you rebuild the country. What was the mistake? The main mistake of German re reunification was that we did not create mid-sized companies there. Most of the companies were either closed or sold to large corporations. Don't strive to create Fortune Global 500 companies. It, it, it will not work. Instead, help foster strong SMEs, foster entrepreneurship. Focus on the specific advantages of Ukraine. Of course, Acro and IT immediately come to mind. Deepen the value chain. Don't confine yourself to raw material export. When you export all the agricultural products, question is, can you get a bigger part of the value chain by not exporting the raw material, but uh, processed products? 
Then I think the fact that so many Ukrainians have left the country is also an opportunity. If they come back, they bring back their international experience. And of course, take advantage of future European Union membership, which hopefully will come in the next couple of years. I wrote that down in, in my books, also my own entrepreneurial career. And I can say, I followed for Simon Kutcher the Hidden Champions strategy one-to-one. -one. We aspire to be the best in our field. We focus especially on pricing, marketing, and we globalize. So I can say from my own experience, the Hidden Champions strategy works. Thank you very much for your patience and your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Simon. Uh, uh... Well, it, it works, we, we, we know that. Thank you for a very insightful uh, presentation. Now we have some time for uh, for questions and uh, we also even have some questions from Mr. Karl Bell from Zurich. No, not very far from, from Zurich Berlin. even. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I will, I will start with innovation. I would a little bit rephrase or paraphrase differently the questions of uh, Mr. Kalber, and we'll come back to this. Uh, you mentioned innovation as a key point, uh, or one of the key points, you know, focusing innovation, globalization, the company. What are um, conditions? Inside company, you mentioned uh, patents, uh, 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 but what are other, uh, let's say, components to uh, somehow um, create? There are two essential components which I mentioned. And the most important one is closeness to customer, really knowing what the problems and needs of the customers are. And most of the hidden champions are in industrial markets, in B2B markets, and they know very well what their customer problems are. And then the second component is the competencies you have. Can you solve these problems better than the competition? But both components are inseparable. And as I said, they have to be integrated customer needs and uh, technical competencies. And the hidden champions are much better than large corporations on that. So I think that is the key. Of course, there are many other aspects like innovation is a concern of the CEO and the hidden champions. In large corporations, it's uh, maybe a board member, an executive board member, or even a level below the, the management. Then, for instance, you have much less friction uh, among, among uh, functions, among uh, procurement, manufacturing, uh, sales, etc. That leads to higher speed in innovation. They, they need less time to innovate than more complex organizations. Why Germany? What's what special is in Germany, um, which create uh, that is a so, so many, yeah so many a, a very good and uh, complex question. I give you two reasons. One reason is that Germany until 1918 has not been a nation state, unlike France or Japan or uh, the United States. Until 1918, Germany consisted of 22 monarchies, uh, yeah, 22 monarchies and three republics. So an entrepreneur in Munich who did business with uh, Dresden in Sachsen or Stuttgart in Württemberg, that was international business because Munich was the kingdom of Bavaria Stuttgart was the kingdom of uh, Württemberg and uh, Dresden was the kingdom of uh, Saxonia, Saxony. And I, I think that has become part of the DNA with regard to internationalization and globalization. I observe that German entrepreneurs go much earlier, much faster international than uh, entrepreneurs in France or Japan or the United States. So that is a globalization aspect. And, and the same is true for Switzerland and Austria as small countries. As far as competencies are concerned, in these states, we often had local clusters. And let me, let me describe two examples to illustrate that. 
in the Black Forest, we had a centuries old um, tradition of making watches and clocks, like cuckoo clocks, for instance. This industry had totally disappeared, but they have these fine mechanical competencies and they applied those competencies to a new industry, namely medical technology. Today in the Black Forest, we have more than 500 medical technology firms, many of them hidden champions. Can you imagine that? A second example, in Göttingen, small university town in northern Germany, we have 39 measurement technology firms. How, how come? The root of this is in the mathematical faculty of the University of Göttingen, which had been leading in, in mathematics for centuries. And they, the entrepreneurs applied the laws formulated, detected by the mathematicians to measurement technology. And I could give you several dozens of similar examples where the technical competencies are deeply rooted in history. Uh, another aspect is the German vocational training system. We, we have the best educated workers in the world, what we call Facharbeiter in German, specialized, qualified workers. And there are a couple of other reasons. For instance, among the larger countries, uh, Germany has the most mentally internationalized society. If you compare language, English capabilities for Spain, Italy, uh, let alone uh, Japan or Korea, with Germany, they are far lower. Of course, Switzerland, Netherlands, uh, Scandinavian countries are even better. Smaller countries are better there. But among the large countries, the German society is the most, by far the most internationalized. That's great. Should you, you add your list about your, your strategy, what, what how it looks like and what the company should uh, should uh, uh, follow, uh, some more item like, you know, to be in Germany. Uh, which, uh, which assumes to somehow um, acquire all these roots of history, of uh, approaches. Uh, you mentioned uh, the very important uh, uh, reason to, to have a stable personnel, you know, to have keep people. Uh, it, it assumes a, a culture of, uh, of hiring and firing people, uh, which is different in different countries. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yes. yeah, and that's yeah, but, not not easy to replicate in in, yeah, in other uh, countries. What what that, would be the the, the yeah. tool then to come to Germany to learn mm. how how it works? Or uh, let's say, let me make uh, two remarks. When I started with this hidden champion research thirty years ago. I thought for a couple of years that it's indeed a, a, a German or a German uh, a, a Dach phenomenon. But then over the years, I met so many hidden champions outside Germany, which had the same culture. Often the following thing happened. I, I give a presentation in, uh, in Japan or in America, and somebody afterwards comes to me and said, you exactly described our company. From where do you know it? So... Hidden champions in other countries have similar features. And with regard to employee loyalty, uh, of course, you say hire and fire, hire and fire does not lead to employee loyalty. So the hidden champions, even in crisis, they try to keep their people not to fire them. And then there is a specific interesting advantage that most of the hidden champions, about 70%, are in small towns or villages and not in the big cities. And usually the company, the hidden champion, is the biggest employer. So there is a mutual dependence. The, the, the entrepreneur needs the people from the local uh, places. And the employer employees don't have alternatives, so they have to stay. So the rural location also helps to increase loyalty. It's of course, it has a mirror side that younger people are attracted to the bigger cities. So it's not so easy to, uh, to attract uh, young talent if you are in a rural location. You mentioned focus, uh, focus and ambitious, ambitious uh, ambitions to be the best in the world in a certain, in a certain area. Uh, 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 one of our attendees uh, 
So it's Calbert ask whether it is the same as purpose. Uh, you may comment, but I would extend a little bit this question. Uh, purpose, which is uh, known uh, management uh, yeah, category at the course, moment. Purpose. You know, but 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 you comment. I want to yeah. extend this focus and ambitious. Obviously, ambitions themselves are not enough. Um, uh, because you know there are a lot of ambitions. Yeah, but people. there it starts. It starts with the ambition to be really good or better than the the competition. Uh, of course, you need to know how the stamina to really become the best, and 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 that again defines the interaction with focus. Uh, because I say only focus leads to world class. If you try to do different things to go into different markets uh, this is not the way uh, to to become world class now is purpose and ambition the same my experience is many of these people do very narrow things they sell screws all kinds of screws now would every person be satisfied in terms of purpose is that my mission? Is that my 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 life task with selling screws? And my impression is the the satisfaction, the, the fulfillment of the purpose comes with the focus and with success. That in fact, uh, in in spite of this small focus or or a size of what they do, they're often very satisfied with what they do. That may may not appeal to to everybody uh, because uh, some people have wider ambitions. Um, oh, you may say, let's take my my case. Uh, I, I was a professor for sixteen years, and my research was on pricing. But I also had the ambition to apply this to have an impact on practice. Practice now. You may say, "Oh, pricing—that's a narrow field." How, Herman Simon, can you focus your whole life on pricing? But today we have two thousand two hundred people who focus on pricing, and I would say that eighty-five, ninety percent enjoy it. We'll come back. But it may not be everybody's purpose or mission. We'll come back to pricing if you would mind. But uh, uh, before that, uh, I also would like to touch one issue. Uh, many examples which you mentioned uh, uh, about uh, hidden champions companies uh, 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 during the presentation are suppliers, are suppliers to bigger companies like, you know, yeah. uh, um, and these big companies uh, have a big, uh, let's say, purchasing power. Um, uh, and uh, normally uh, big companies, according to my experience as well, are trying to press you know to control the cost to control the ambitions of 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 this uh, uh, of the of, of their suppliers um, some uh, companies uh, also from from your list uh, are, are escaping uh, this uh, uh, the, this pressure some others uh, um, are, are actually depressed and uh, even could could disappear what are uh, let's say features or tools or, or what kind of uh, instruments um, you may, you may mention in order not to not to be suppressed uh, yeah yeah know, bought disappeared yeah. Uh, dissolve in, in 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 a big corporation and and preserve their own uh, ability to 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 let's call it dictate or not to dictate but but be independent uh, I don't yeah. Know, yeah which word is what is better fits to uh, recently, I presented this number of 767 suppliers, uh, German suppliers, to Apple to a German audience. And one of the, uh, the people said, but that is a tough and difficult job. I would not like to be a supplier to Apple because they put so much pressure on me. When I ask these suppliers to Apple, are you proud? Are you happy to be a supplier? They all say, yes, we are proud to be a supplier to Apple, but we also admit it's a tough shop. They drive us to ever higher performance. And one of the guys uh, following, his name was Krohmann. I explicitly name him. He said, I want the 
toughest customers in the world. And he got many times the, the best quality award from Intel. I want the toughest customer in the world. I said, why? And I asked the same question. I do, doesn't that make your life difficult? He said, they drive us to ever higher performance. What is Chroman Engineering? That was the name of his company today. <laughs> today, this company is called Tesla Automation. So Tesla acquired them. Uh, he had no, no, um, no, no son or daughter who could uh, continue the business, so he had to sell the business uh, five years ago. It's now Tesla Automation. Why did Elon Musk buy them? Because he was so uh, impressed by this company. So my recommendation would be make sure that you have the toughest customer because they drive you to higher performance, to world class. But you should also avoid to become dependent from one single customer. And we have many of these suppliers in Korea and Japan who depend on one single customer, on Samsung Electronics or so. So you should also internationalize, have customers large customers, be it large customers, all over the world. That makes you relatively more powerful against the big guys, makes you less dependent on, on, on one big customer. So even if you have large customers, pay attention that the share which one customer takes from you is not getting too large. Okay, you provoked a question. It's from your vast experience of this vast knowledge about hidden champions. Uh, what are the uh, typical life cycle? Okay, started with a relatively small, very ambitious, uh, uh, directed, uh, mm -hmm. uh, customer oriented, close to customer company with a certain idea, and then grew up, uh, become international, uh, 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 took a niche, uh, special niche. Niches could be smaller, could be smaller. And then what, what, what will happen then? Um, uh, uh, what 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 are typical? Be acquired by by, by a bigger one. Uh, that or... happens, of course. Uh, if we look at the composition oh. today, about uh, seventy percent are are still family owned. Seventy percent are owned by private equity. Uh, Ten percent are owned by private equity uh, investors. Ten percent are publicly listed, and ten percent are part parts of larger uh, corporations or, or groups. That is roughly the composition today. And uh, I mean, the, the longevity is reflected uh, in, in the average age, which is 70 years. The average age of the hidden champions is 70 which years. Which means more or less related to the uh, two generation of, of, uh, of uh, family. Yeah, we have, we have several, several waves. Uh, some uh, not insubstantial percentage have been founded before the First World War. So our, we had a big wave of uh, newly founded companies and then a second big wave after the Second World War. And interestingly, also a new wave in the last 15 to 20 years, especially uh, in, in areas like energy, sustainability, so new areas. And also the digitalization companies I, I named there, they are all... Uh, less than 20, 20 years old. Like DeepL, Celonis, TeamViewer, et cetera. You mentioned uh, in your presentation very interesting examples. But well, just, just briefly, to continue, you mentioned Kerker uh, and, and Steel, uh, Steel um, uh, uh, which actually grew up, uh, become uh, quite bigger, bigger than, than then hit the champion. Then they Steel ready. is actually last year or so uh, they surpassed the five billion threshold. Yes, yes. So I'm not, I have been thinking of, of of extending the threshold to ten million. We are discussing that currently. They no longer in a change, sir. They are they are much wider at the moment. They are, they are extending their 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 presence in this uh, in this uh, different uh, tools for uh, uh, for working also professionally. Yeah, that is true, but uh, they are still focused. They make uh, tools for forestry for gardening, uh, increasingly with uh, with with batteries. But they do not go into motorcycles or cars or, uh, or industrial machinery. So I would say they are much wider than chainsaws. 
but they stayed close to their competencies in terms of of customer needs and and the technology. For instance, which nobody knows, Honda is the biggest producer of uh, small combustion engines for lawnmowers for and steel it, it can be that steel is number two at least one of the top five producers of small combustion engines because in all these handheld tools you need a small engine in in ukraine we know that honda is is, is a major product uh, manufacturer of the combustion engine because uh, of, yeah. uh, of the war and the uh, generators uh, are actually a common uh, mm -hmm. in, in in every country house yeah. and, and everywhere yeah. in many of them are, have honda engines yeah that means that still next year may appear in this segment that's a natural development could be, like growth, could be, growth, yeah. growth 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 so yeah. the champion can become like character as well yeah. uh, and of uh, course uh, there are there are markets but very few markets are really saturated on a global level but it may happen if you are for instance um the the producer of uh, cigarette machines uh you you suffer from the uh, declining consumption of of, of cigarettes and um the company which had 90% of the cigarette machine market, uh, Kerber in Hamburg, they are now diversified into, for instance, paper machines. Uh, when you make cigarettes, you need you have very good know-how about paper, uh, which is rolled around the tobacco. Uh, so they, uh, the situation may come where you have to diversify, of course, if the market is saturated. Brent Kerbel also asked about, uh, and it's important, uh, I also agree, about the focus of understanding of needs, you know, the customers. And you mentioned several times about that hidden champions are much better than, than big companies in understanding the customers and serving their, their needs. Uh, what is the tool? What are methods? What are instruments companies may use to uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to to learn more about uh, uh, it's not primarily what we teach in marketing in terms of market research etc it's primarily the personal experience and contact and that is also reflected in interesting number 38 percent of the employees of the hidden champions have regular customer contacts 38 percent in large corporations that's eight percent i think that defines a large part of difference and then practices let me give you one example uh, the the ceo of Kronis. Kronis is a global leader in bottling system also a big champion now with close to five billion and the ceo said the following who knows best what the customer problems are not the engineering in the R&D department, the engineers there, but the service technicians. So he held every month a meeting which he presided on the one side of the table, the service technicians who came back from their jobs around the world, on the other side, the R&D engineers. And he lent his authority so that the service engineers as a service technicians really can express their findings their experience and uh, communicate it to the much better educated engineers and and uh, doctors of physics or whatever they have so that's uh, one one case which illustrates the role of the ceo for improvement and uh, innovation and it's also a cultural issue for instance miele the washing machine producer their motto is since 125 years, immer besser, always better. Every day a little better, a little better than the competition, a little, little better than yesterday. That's ingrained in their corporate culture. I, I would say if you ask an employee, an average employee of Miele, what is the motto of your company, he would say immer besser. That's great. I, I, I'd like to draw attention of all our attendees and everybody who would uh, uh, view this uh, further in uh, in video. Uh, uh, in my opinion, it's very important what you've just said. Uh, uh, the friends and colleagues, you know, running business, you, you may check if not every set of your employees 
uh, have contacts with customers, <laughs> you are in trouble. So you, you need you need to have more people um, uh, um, relation uh, and, and knowing what are your customers' yeah. uh, uh, needs. I mean, eight percent means measured, only every every twelfth employee has cust direct customer it's contact. Measured easily, easily. So if you only your marketing department or sales are involved, uh, you are in trouble. You you need you need yeah. to do more. You need to do better. You could could be included in the you know, balance scorecard or okay, or, or KPI. Yeah, or, that would be an interesting that's, indicator that's, yeah that, that, that's easy <laughs> so we are, we are have running out of time but i can't but uh, um, ask the question which is, was not the the, uh, the the subject of your presentation today but you mentioned this and um, yeah, reminded me that a big part of your work and uh, several books were devoted to pricing and you mentioned that pricing was uh, was important and one of the idea which I know is uh, not to use cost plus. Um, mm, uh, mm, correct me if I'm wrong. And I would do appreciate uh, uh, your uh, uh, few few words about what kind of approach to pricing companies yeah. should uh, uh, take yeah. in order to be successful in this respect. I I, I said we are pricing specialists, so. Everybody thinks we look primarily at the price relative to the competition, etc. No, that's not true. The core is value, value to customer, or even better, perceived value to customer. And the Romans in their Latin, Latin language were very smart. They have the same word for value and price, namely precium, like in precious. I don't know whether you still learned Latin. Mm -hmm. I, I had forgotten it, actually. So this is the fundamental equation, the ever eternal equation of successful pricing. Value equals precium equals price. What does this mean? You must understand value, you must create value, you must communicate value, for instance, in terms of brand, and only if you really understand and can quantify value, get your price right. Well, so uh, I would I'm... say if if everybody takes this simple message and uh, use pretium as uh, the means against forgetting this. That's uh, that. That's great. Uh, I would be uh, pleased and love uh, to to have you again, either in Kiev or another lecture in Zoom or whatever, to uh, to teach uh, uh, students uh, and to add a few more ideas about how to measure uh, your performance uh, uh, in respect of uh, being closer to the customer, valuing. Uh, customers, uh, uh, customers' needs and becoming the champion. Uh, and then uh, you may choose uh, whether to remain hidden uh, or become very public uh, and, and make uh, uh, the huge, uh, uh, how to call, uh, uh, huge appearance worldwide, like many uh, German companies, uh, uh, part of them, some of them you mentioned already uh, during today uh, are present everywhere, are no longer hidden because they, um, uh, we need them. Uh, Professor uh, Simon, thank you very much for your insightful presentation and discussion. Many thanks also to our audience and I beg your pardon, everybody who, who asked questions and uh, was not able to get direct answer from Professor uh, Simon. Uh, sorry, we have limited time and try to uh, follow our uh, time limits. Um, uh, we are looking forward to uh, invite you and uh, the possibility for you as a hood girls to come to Ukraine. Uh, uh, um, These uh, current circumstances are not very are not very pleasant and welcome, but uh, uh, the situation will change and we are struggling uh, everywhere, fighting, uh, not only here, but only on the fronts, uh, on the battlefields uh, on the east of Ukraine to make it happen sooner. Um, uh, I trust the recording uh, of this uh, presentation and lecture and discussion afterwards uh, was uh, will be viewed by many participants. It will be available on the on um, uh, site of our company uh, of the project and also on Minkiev site. 
And I'd like to draw attention of uh, our audience that the uh, Reinforced UA project uh, continues, uh, and uh, but currently we meet only once a month. So our next meeting uh, will be in January, uh, at the set uh, uh, January, uh, set Wednesday of January, well, uh, January 18th. Uh, please mark your calendars and uh, uh, follow and somehow um, visit uh, the website to check uh, what uh, and who will be next. And as it is the last uh, uh, meeting uh, during this year, I, I will make a little bit different uh, uh, closing than, than typically. Uh, the world currently is preparing to celebrate, uh, but uh, 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 celebrate and remark uh, the Christmas or other seasons uh, of, of celebration and uh, meeting the, the new year. <clears throat> I, I think that our season uh, in Ukraine will be marked by uh, more missile attack uh, rather than fireworks. Uh, and uh, mm, uh, people at the moment, if you would look at the outlets of news outlets worldwide, are uh, much less concerned about what's going on in Ukraine. They are much more concerned about what's going on in the Middle East and uh, uh, much more want to celebrate and not to think about those hard things which we are experiencing. Um, I am not going to argue whether the... Um, war changed its meaning, the war in Ukraine changed its meaning for the world. But I'm sure that it hasn't changed the meaning for uh, for us, Ukrainian living here. We need to keep fighting and we need to win this war, uh, uh, both not only on the battlefields, uh, but uh, also in minds, in our own minds and in minds of uh, people uh, uh, outside. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, the reason why we live at the moment. That's the purpose of our life. And we do we need to do it uh, in uh, with all our uh, focusing and with all our ambitions uh, to uh, be ready to fight and be prepared to win. And uh, with this, I once again appreciate, uh, Professor Simon, your presence here today and uh, all our guests during this project uh, uh, before. I draw attention of our audience, they can visit and see uh, uh, excellent videos of excellent thinkers worldwide, which would help us uh, to win this war, uh, to win uh, and to be better and to understand the world better and to make business better. That's very important for us at the moment. This is our bet. With this, best regards uh, and take care. Uh, goodbye. Thank you very much. And I wish you peace next year and also a peaceful Christmas for you, everybody, and their families. Thank you Thank very you. much. The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.org.